Hello and welcome you're watching One India News. This is Global Chit Chat, our weekly show where we speak about the recent developments in the geopolitical sphere in the recent week with our expert Mr. Tridivesh Singh Maini. Hello sir, welcome back to our show. Thank you very much. Thanks. Uh, so sir, the, as you know that you know last Thursday, Imran Khan, former Pakistan Prime Minister Imran Khan, he was attacked uh, while he was in his rally in Wazirabad and now today he said that he is going to resume the rally now. So in this context of, you know, him being attacked by, and he said, he uh, alleges that, you know, this attack was pre-planned and it was uh, uh, somewhat uh, uh, Shehbaz Sharif and two others are responsible for this attack. So, in this entire backdrop, what do you think that Pakistan is going to, and the entire rally, uh, analysts are also saying that, you know, uh, his, uh, the support for Imran Khan is going to increase now that he has been attacked. And this entire backdrop, how do you think that Pakistan stands uh, both in the geopolitical sphere and in its uh, internal political sphere? Okay, so see, uh, as far as Imran Khan's ties with the army, uh, mm -hmm. Over the past year, and obviously in the last few days, that's no secret because especially the main difference was obviously, you know, the anti-West sort of rhetoric by Imran Khan. And uh, obviously the army felt that, you know, they can't totally be dependent upon China. And you saw that even before his ouster, you saw the army chief uh, making certain statements that, you know, the US and Pakistan uh, have been close, uh, worked very closely in the past. So Pakistan doesn't want it does not want to be part of any camp politics. You saw all that happening. So that is one part. The other is obviously this this has happened at a time when the long march has been carrying on. Imran Khan is calling for polls, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, and obviously there is support amongst the youth. Now, the timing is interesting because I think at the probably uh, around uh, you know the end of this month, uh, Pakistan has to choose a new army chief. Mm -hmm. So that is one thing which you need to look at. The second is, you know, uh, on the one hand, there is obviously a lot of uh, support amongst the youth. But on the other, if you actually go through the, you know, Pakistani newspapers, if you uh, go to the commentary and all, uh, a lot of people who are from, uh, the, you could say, the old guard, uh, you know, old, the old school thinking in Pakistan, they have uh, been paying attention to uh, the economy and some of the important steps which have been taken in that direction. So obviously you have contrary views. You have those who believe that uh, at this point of time, the primary issue is obviously what has happened, which is very unfortunate, but support for Imran Khan uh, is unanimous and uh, that is a primary issue. On the other, you also have some interesting things taking place. You have, you know, obviously uh, ties with the US have improved to some extent. Last week, the Pakistan finance minister said that China and uh, the Saudis, they have also committed to providing more financial assistance. Chinese uh, committed to providing assistance to the tune of uh, nearly 9 billion. Saudis, 4 billion. Saudis are also probably now uh, going to, again, you know, in between, they had uh, scrapped the idea of investing in Gwadar. Mm -hmm. In 2019, they spoken about investing in So, you have... Uh, there are parallelly, I mean, two important things are happening. On the one hand, probably uh, in terms of foreign policy, there is a certain balancing taking place. Um, and it's not, I, I would not say that the credit necessarily goes to the new dispensation or the discredit goes to Maran Khan for what happened earlier. I think it's really the changing uh, uh, sort of geopolitical situation. And as a number of strategic analysts have often said, even in India, that the location is such, you know, that however we, I mean, when India, when we look at things from the Indian perspective, at times uh, uh, we lose sight of the ground realities. Now, mm -hmm. even though there's a major differential in terms of the economy and many other areas, but the fact is geopolitically Pakistan is very important, right? Mm -hmm. And it's also a, a lot of Western countries do use ties with Pakistan as a lever in the context mm -hmm. of geopolitics of South Asia. So as of now, I don't, I totally, uh, there is no doubt that uh, if elections were to be held, Imran has a lot of support amongst the youth. And also, uh, more than the part about Imran Khan, I would just like to end this, you know, over here with a couple of... You see, traditionally in uh, Pakistan, Punjab has... The Punjab province is the 
decisive factor in the politics so if you look mm-hmm. at the pakistani army uh, it is dominated by punjab i mean you know even western strategic analyst they've written that how from a handful of districts of punjab you know the army is mm-hmm. so that, that is a traditional view point but you saw this changing uh, a few times first if you notice uh, in 2007 when the lawyers movement happened that got maximum support in punjab so that was a transition uh, towards democracy and of course that didn't last very long though you had i mean zardari's government last the ppp government lasted then uh, nawaz sharif's government also did last mm-hmm. five years though he was three or four years so that's one now you're having a similar thing again because amran also has most of his support obviously he has support all over the country but a large part of the support base is uh, from the province of punjab and from the youngsters so mm-hmm. that is very interesting because as i said you know traditionally uh, in fact like for instance certain country like the afghans they called the pakistan army a punjabi army so punjab is mm-hmm. dominant if that mm-hmm. comes around and if once again you know in punjab not and i'm not saying that they're going to turn again but if there is a support uh, for imran and there's a, a clear message that there should be a strong civil military balance and civilian leadership should be running the show is even in foreign policy that is very important now whether yeah. it happens now and it may not necessarily be that imran khan you know right right away comes romps back home or comes but this has definitely set a trend i mean it's happened for the first time that such open mm-hmm. conflict and you know the, because earlier also nawaz sharif and all also had problems with the army but you know there was a certain they were more uh, defensive this mm-hmm. type of approach is very different and also mm-hmm. the support base amongst the youth because see, every there is a demographic shift so you are seeing a change over there and if, if the youth is with you so you know politically that is very important so yes. that is as far as the politics is concerned and also even in terms of foreign policy this is important because i think even though this the new government uh, under shahbaz sharif they have you know tried to uh, improve ties with the west but they are also categorically <laughs> they don't want to be part of any camp politics so they have good relations mm-hmm. with the us Mm-hmm. they're saying i mean they want to have good relations with the us as yet it's a working relationship mm-hmm. and they are trying to put uh, obviously even china had issues with the cpec project with the security of chinese nationals and so on. so they are trying to put so i think imran, apart from the domestic politics even in terms of foreign policy i think imran's uh, the messaging about having a balanced foreign policy because he what he had earlier was uh, at one stage you know first pakistan is to very there was one stage where it was very easy for pakistan to be close to both china and the us after the integration of ties it had to make choices and then obviously it moved much closer to uh, uh, china after the cpec project and after the us moved closer to india then you had the india and us number of developments right so balancing became tough hmm. now again yeah. the situation where the old guard you know there are certain people in pakistan who realize that you need to have a working relationship with the us you can't be totally dependent upon china so that is there and of course uh, suddenly even though there may be murmurs of discontent mm-hmm. against the chinese who can't uh, they are so uh, invested in the economy even though they mm-hmm. may want to sort of you know uh, reduce the level of their investment so that is yeah. the thing and and uh, i may also add you know uh, there was a conference recently uh, in the us a couple of interesting points emerged one was this talk about pakistan not wanting to be part of any camp politics the other was i, I think uh, commented strategic analyst from one of the us think tanks mm-hmm. actually said that china does not mind if pakistan actually has a working relationship with the us so this okay. is interesting because you see on the one hand we look at it as zero sum but on the other mm-hmm. again there is a ground reality that you know the us realizes it cannot sort the economic mess on its own and political mm-hmm. instability is not good similarly china mm-hmm. also probably realizes that you know the you know that they cannot sort out the economy so that is why you also see pakistan looking at not just china and the us but saudi arabia uae uh, mm-hmm. all that sort of happening so there are some interesting churns uh, which are going on and i would say that uh, irrespective of, uh, of in whatever else uh, uh, one may say i think this Uh, especially the, the civil military relationship in pakistan i think that is the the question marks which have been placed 
with regard to the military dominance and so i think to the degree to which it has happened it's happened earlier but to the mm. degree to which it happens for the first time and this would impact not just domestic but even the overall foreign policy and the imprint of civilian administrations on foreign policy because so far it's a given that you know the army decides the policy vis-a-vis -vis china vis-a-vis -vis mm. india vis-a-vis -vis what you know all the important so that could also uh, witness a change Right, right. And uh, speaking about Pakistan and China and dependence on Chinese economy, there are reports that have emerged that Chinese exports fell by 0.3% in October from a year ago in US dollar terms. And uh, it has. it's also saying that imports fell in October by 0.7% in US dollars term. Now, reports have suggested that this is an unexpected fall. So why do you think or why is it being called unexpected to begin with? So I think this is, uh, I think first of all, again, you know, uh, as we've been discussing, the sudden mm -hmm. spurt in COVID cases mm -hmm. again, and the restrictions mm -hmm. which have been, been mm -hmm. imposed. This is for the month of October yes. till September. And this this decline is the first uh, since May 2020. Yes. So uh, very, I mean, basically one is obviously the fact that uh, COVID-19, the restrictions which have been imposed, and mm -hmm. as a result, you know, over the last <clears throat> nearly three years now, two and a half years plus, uh, obviously the global supply chains have also got disturbed significantly. Uh, you, in fact, Apple has also said that there will be a dip in it because we had spoken mm -hmm. last time also that one of the major manufacturing mm -hmm. cities, you know, there was a, mm -hmm. a COVID outbreak around there. So, uh, in fact, some of the workers were also leaving the place. So, uh, essentially, it is uh, the it's the handling uh, one is the covid the way it has been handled and the fact that you know uh, uh, i think the policies have been probably the most stringent you have mm -hmm. 10 cases 15 cases 20, you know you actually impose a lockdown mm -hmm. so it's to do mm -hmm. and overall obviously even the uh, global supply chains the deterioration of ties with so many countries that in the aftermath of covid that has also impacted, uh, you know, its uh, trade linkages. For instance, I think there has been a dip uh, if you look at exports to uh, EU, US. So I think there is also, uh, uh, even in terms of the foreign policy, uh, China also needs to look at a course correction and mm -hmm. uh, for its own economy, uh, for getting mm -hmm. the interests of other countries. Because it cannot, you see, China has benefited a lot from globalization and you know, when, as we discussed earlier, when Donald Trump had taken over for some time, uh, Xi Jinping tried to project himself uh, as a la sort of last man standing, you know, for the global yeah. order and all. Obviously, it was it was yeah. rhetoric. There were other countries. Yeah. You had uh, Macron and you had other people doing it. But he was yeah. trying to say, he was taking a very contradictory tone. And at that point of time, ties between China and many of the US allies, especially Western yeah. countries, hadn't deteriorated so much. So the significant... Yeah was okay. But now uh, things have changed. And I think, uh, as we'll also discuss probably in the next, on the next issue, uh, there is, uh, China will have to go in for a course correction in terms of its domestic economic policies, mm -hmm. and in terms of even its uh, foreign policy, uh, mm -hmm. to, uh, you know, because so far, uh, the outside world, uh, mm -hmm. even if it is not totally uh, Skeptical or pessimistic, it is certainly confused. You know, mm. many people are certainly confused about what path you know China is on, especially after the recent session, after the CPC, and and also if you see the uh, the individuals who uh, Xi Jinping has picked. I mean, as as we've discussed earlier, really, economically none of them are really pro reform. Mm. Even in terms of foreign policy, you can say they're more they're more hawkish. So those are things which. And yeah, at speaking about China's course correction when it comes to foreign policies, uh, apparently Xi Jinping is going to embark a journey uh, like a later this month outside China, which is a very rare occurrence. I think since the COVID-19 pandemic, he has stepped out of the country once and he is letting uh, other leaders uh, like from leaders of Vietnam, Tanzania, he let uh, other leaders in the country as well. So do you think that that's uh, his way of correcting the course or do you think that it's something else there and then the most interesting is the recent visit of the german chancellor right, right? Uh, and obviously uh, after the covid pandemic uh, as you've said there have been very few visits and this coming from a, a g7 member state is all the more important uh, now the, the first question which specifically this visit raises is that in between obviously you know we had 
you had seen that countries like australia uk and all mm. they had totally their approach towards china was mirroring that of the us now mm. at the ground reality stuck struck that germany is trying to strike a balance uh, issues like human rights you know uh, mm. uh, hong kong all of those are put on the table mm-hmm. they were not but mm. is there a realization that obviously you know that germany also realized that it needs to strike a balance so the question is one obviously there's a cost correction in terms of china's foreign policy and as you said he's probably made only one visit overseas for the shanghai mm-hmm. cooperation organization and i think mm-hmm. the foreign nation states uh, mm-hmm. he visited uh, xi jinping and now of course you've had visits from uh, as you mentioned vietnam leaders of vietnam and pakistan yeah and yeah. uh, mm-hmm. and all that so that's so now obviously is again you know uh, whether it is his own messaging that you know uh, he wants to send out a particular message outside uh, whether it is also to put uh, to at least ensure a modicum of yeah. you know uh, stability and to put even if there are tensions <laughs> to ensure mm-hmm. that they are manageable yeah. right? so that you could see that and, and in fact uh, i think china is investing a lot one is these visits china is also now investing a lot in uh, strength mm-hmm. ties with the gulf countries so i think the one of the visits probably mm-hmm. is to uh, if i'm not mistaken i don't know but it's probably to uh, saudi arabia mm-hmm. so, what's, so what's happening is obviously so what china would ideally want is a uh, manageable tensions with mm-hmm. the us and other countries tensions but manageable uh, maybe mm-hmm. a slightly better relationship with countries like within the eu those who want mm-hmm. to balance out and actually most importantly it would focus a lot on the middle powers right yeah. right and 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 these middle powers i mean as i have said you know within uh, the gulf uh, countries whether you look at turkey whether it, so they are obviously you know the middle east is very important in terms of oil in terms of economics in terms of china also again because you know sending out a message with regard to its strategic clout and there's obviously a vacuum over there yeah. so you see but it cannot only be a policy of uh, now post covid it has to be very different the the mm. economy is in a different situation the world order is totally different right and you could uh, the other uh, uh, challenge i mean while on the one hand you know everybody talks about the qcd trap and how china is gay. but tomorrow again in 2024 if you have donald trump and he takes an, again an aggressive stance with china so china's mm. challenges are likely to increase so in that mm-hmm. much time in the interim they china beijing also needs to go for certain course corrections and it cannot just continue to uh, up the ante right 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 so thank you so much for all the information that you've given us today and thank you everybody for watching one india news catch us again on global chit chat next week thank you